Thank Hi, Robbie. Hi, Linda. So great to see you from across the world. I know it's been a while since you were in Sydney. Um, I'm so delighted to be here. And thank you so much, Pierce, for those, for those uh, lovely introductions. Um, it's a great joy to uh, be able to talk about Ravi Shankar's um, uh, memoir, Correctional, which is absolutely spectacular. And I, I think that after this, uh, if you don't have it already, you will all run out and get it because it's a, a, an amazing book. And we're going to get into this conversation and, and uh, show you <laughs> some of its amazingness. Uh, there's so much to cover in this journey that you describe in Correctional, Ravi. Um, from your child, from your childhood, um, growing up in an immigrant family from India, um, going from a very, you know, a, a childhood where you were on the one hand the champion spelling bee and the obedient little, you know, Indian good Indian boy, um, to um, and, and but also the one who wanted to be cool and uh, was a little bit of a bad boy for his American friends. <laughs> um, you went from there to uh, parties with George Plimpton and the New York, you know, liter literati, glitterati, um, celebrity infested parties, all that sort of thing. And then to jail and then out of jail and then back to jail a few times. And here you are today. So um, it is quite a journey. One of the really great things about your book, which I absolutely love, besides the incredible elegance of the writing, which will be no surprise to anybody who's read any of Ravi's poetry um, or, or other writing, is that you put on the table here all of the subjects that are banned from polite, um, shall I say, Connecticut or just American dinner party conversation. <laughs> and those subjects include politics, race, class, sex, structural disadvantage, and mental health. And not to mention the incredible number of swamp Yankees and statues of Puritan toss, port, toss, toss pots, as you put it, uh, in places like New London, Connecticut, which I hope we have a chance to get to as well. But um, <laughs> we're gonna get to all the tough issues. Like why people in New London, in New London bars play songs like she thinks my tractor's sexy. Mm. We'll get there, but um, let's start with the real fluff. Let's let's start with the happy place. Um, what? How did you get into this waspy literary dream world of Manhattan um, that led you to make a Faustian bargain, as you say, with your inner hustler that you will succeed in this wor world of affluence and privilege, whatever the cost? Tell us about tell us about your entry into this into this glitter land. Well, uh, yes, and I should just back up a little bit and thank you so much, Linda and Pierce. It's wonderful to be here and have this conversation. And of course, I was, as a dutiful um, first generation Indian American son, I was meant to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. You know, as I like to see, Sefi Poet was very low, somewhere between a garbage collector and rodeo clown on the totem pole of preferred profession. Uh, and so I really, um, when I decided I wanted to become a writer, which I did in college, and then subsequently uh, living in San Francisco, uh, and when I went to New York to go to graduate school, um, I was at Columbia at a time, and actually uh, Richard Howard uh, just passed away a couple of days ago, and he uh, was the poetry professor there and the poetry editor of the Paris Review, the great translator, I think of him, he was Roland Barthes' translator, among others, uh, and a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Uh, and he recommended that I become a reader uh, there. And this was when uh, the Paris Review was in George Plimpton's little townhouse at 72nd in York on the Upper East Side. And uh, he lived on the top three floors and the bottom two floors were the offices of the Paris Review. And, uh, you know, he was a, a lovely, genial man who um, would tell stories and come down and sometimes um, ask me if I wanted to shoot billiards with him instead of do the reading of, for the afternoon, which I was all, always happily, happy to oblige. And uh, he also had a, an amazing array of paraphernalia. I, I found in Plimpton this um, an almost kind of protean, uh, effortless sensibility for someone who interviewed Muhammad Ali in Rumble in the Jungle and uh, worked as a lion tamer in the circus and played professional football and was a fireworks commissioner of 
uh, New York City and was an actor in Goodwill Hunting and wrote a great biography of Truman Capote and founded the Paris Review, among many things. And so, you know, and, and these parties, it really was, I had a romanticized vision of being in New York. I'm, I'm supposed most writers do. I always felt like I wanted to be there in some way. And this epitomized these parties he had because it really truly would have um, anyone from a busker on the street to a mayoral candidate. And somehow he's the only one, it's a very Plimpton-esque uh, uh, phenomenon, but he had managed to get his parties um, sponsored by McAllen Scotch. And they, they would <laughs> just have a guy like serving this delicious 18 year old Scotch <laughs> who had paid Plimpton to be there and serve the booze. I, I, I still don't understand how he was able to pull that off. But, um, and, you know, I love, especially the Paris Review interview series where they interview writers uh, of various kinds. And uh, um, just being around all of that felt to me like, wow, this is what the literary world is meant to be. And even though I was just on the periphery of it, um, it still felt like, okay, I can see a way in which this is the life, um, kind of a, a new bohemianism, uh, movable feast kind of life that's still happening today, is what it felt like. And yet, um, as you say, um, the apple sort of browned for you, didn't it? Um, the big apple browned. <laughs> it uh, went a little rotten after 2001. What was that? What, well, describe what happened then. yeah, so, you know, I, I lived in New York for uh, uh, almost eight years. I, I went to graduate school there and then I relocated to Brooklyn and was working at a literary agency with this kind of uh, uh, Uber agent, John Brockman, who, who I write about was quite a character. And then, of course, 9-11 happened. And, you know, I was in the city. I still remember very distinctly walking across the Brooklyn Bridge and the kind of very brief moment for lasted about, I would say, three or four months where New Yorkers were really kind to each other and everyone came together in this big way. But what I didn't realize, and I was devastated, and I found New York was the first place I felt truly at home. Um, my sense of difference didn't matter like it did in Northern Virginia, certainly like it did later when I was to move to uh, Connecticut. Um, but uh, then what I didn't realize would happen is in the aftermath, um, I would kind of be painted as a threat um, because of my ethnicity. And there isn't a lot of sophistication when it comes to xenophobia. And so anyone, doesn't matter if you uh, wear a, a, a turban or you're Turkish or uh, you're Arab or Indian, right? Uh, and so things did kind of um, start shifting for me a little bit there. And um, I subsequently left New York and I moved to Connecticut. Um, to begin this job. And, um, you know, when I, it was when I returned to New York many years later that the first of these kinds of dominoes that I, d I write about falls. Um, let's talk briefly about race and uh, because you've, you've alluded to this throughout. Um, I mean, when you were growing up, um, there was a certain amount of uh, racism that was directed at your family when you would go to restaurants. Uh, there would, there'd never be a table somehow, but other people always got tables and your mother got various comments when she was wearing a sari and so on. Um, and you said that you were always really conscious of this difference, but when you, you, you expected when you went to India for a time as a child, that maybe that's where you would fit in. What happened? Yeah, uh, I actually found that when I went to India and I'd, I'd been there when I was a very young infant, I didn't really remember it. And I went for this more extended period when my grandmother got ill, um, we actually picked up in India, there's this notion of Dharma, familial duty if uh, you always put your family ahead of everything else. And so we picked up and moved back to India uh, where I lived for about 18 months and went to school. And instead of really feeling like I fit in, all of a sudden in India, I was too American. The kids said <laughs> that I sounded like John Wayne. Uh, everyone would be like, here comes the American kid. And it was like, what? Well, this is, you know, this is really um, whiplash sense of double exile because it was like, okay, I, I clearly don't fit in here as well. And I didn't realize um, this was back in the pre-internet era, right? So things that would happen in America would kind of happen in India six months later. And so there would be, you know, certain video games or comic books I would know about that my cousins didn't. And I was marked by this difference. And I, I also think they thought I was immensely privileged and, and wealthy. Um, which compared to some of them, perhaps, my, my parents were pretty middle class, I think, were probably pretty equivalent to others of them. Yeah, and then, and then, but you had, and you, you talk about having this kind of bifurcated personality, um, because you were, 
kind of too Indian for Americans, but too too American for in for 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 Indians. And then you and you wanted to kind of be both. And it was only through writing. Let's talk about that. It was only through being uh, accepted into Columbia and finding that actually this could be an advantage. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I for me, being bicultural was always a, a, a curse. I mean, I um, felt I wanted to fit in, in in the U.S. I wanted to assimilate. And um, of course, I was marked by difference. My parents still wanted me to be a Tamilian Brahmin. Uh, we went to Hindu temple. My mother would pack me these, you know, every immigrant probably has the quintessential lunchtime story, but I would get these delicious thalis with uh, sambar and uh, dosas and itlis for my lunch. And I would be so embarrassed. I would always dump it out on the way. There was a bush that I'm sure uh, who knows what is growing there now because I, I I would fertilize it every day on the way to school. It was tragic. I would starve rather than be marked out for uh, further difference. And it, it was a time I feel like, you know, my daughters who are going to school now see, it seems much more inclusive, although they have anxieties of their own that is vastly different than what we had to deal with. But um, I, I, I really did feel this sense of difference. And I think in part is what made me a writer because um, when you don't fit in, you observe, you yes. kind of look around and you see what's happening. And you also kind of uh, get a sense of different dynamics that are at play. And it was when I got to Columbia that I realized, well, in fact, instead of a curse, this is really a blessing because I have this um, ancient corpus of literature, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, the Rig Veda, that is part of, I speak Tamil, that's my mother tongue. I know a little bit of Sanskrit. And um, in fact, the Western canon that I'm being taught here needs to have some infusion from the rest of the world. And in fact, my familiarity with some of this idiom uh, could actually be a, a strength. And, you know, of course, that was also the time of, you know, uh, well, yoga was really catching on and Tantra and this like embrace, <laughs> perhaps exoticized, uh, of Indian culture uh, in a lot of ways. And yeah, that was the first time I felt like, oh, this is not a deficit, but in fact, this is kind of a, a good thing uh, that I feel really very deeply lucky now that I have these two cultures. And um, you had settled into this, uh, I mean, you had gone to Connecticut, um, you know, after this, you, you went to Connecticut, um, but you still managed to be part of New York life and you had a launch of your, um, one of the very first electronic journals of literature was uh, founded by you, The Drunken Boat, still going. Um, and the, there was a glamorous launch at a lovely uh, art gallery and all of this, but here you are, you finally kind of settled into everything. You are who you are. It's all good. Um, you've made this Faustian bargain in the background, but that hasn't come into play yet, uh, about, you know, and um, everything's good. Now, your, your then wife, who you call Parker, um, didn't want to go from Connecticut to New York for the launch because she couldn't stand being around all these egotistical writers, <laughs> which was probably a sign of things to come. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So you ended up taking a cousin from New Jersey and um, you were driving him, you were, you were still in Manhattan, you were driving, you were going to drive him back home and something happened that changed your life. Tell us about this incident because that's kind of, I suppose if this were a drama, it would be called the uh, inciting incident. The inciting incident. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So this was uh, after I had finished living in New York after 9-11, actually, I was kind of laid off from the agency and uh, ended up getting this job in, in Connecticut, my dream job, really. I was a poet in residence and teaching undergraduates about poetry, although I lived in a, a really uh, small, homogenous Connecticut town. And even though it was two hours away, it might as well have been two continents away, Connecticut from New York, which is very <laughs> surprising. And so I would. I would often go back. I still had friends there. And I wanted to feel that sense of urban charge um, you know, I hope we can talk a little bit because, of course, you know Connecticut very well and kind of escaped from there. And as, as best I know, you haven't really returned uh, <laughs> That's to right. visit family. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if Connecticut has that effect on people, but, uh, y you know, I really still feel uh, felt like a New Yorker. You know, I was living in Connecticut, but my essence and uh, my aesthetics were really very New York school, I felt. And uh, when I was um, just heading home from this literary event, I was just in Midtown Manhattan with my cousin Anand, 
um, right near where the Macy's is, Harold Square. And I took a, a totally legal left turn. And all of a sudden I see the lights of a cop car behind me. And I was like, oh, I don't know what happened. I mean, um, I pull over, of course. I was a little nervous because I had a drink at dinner, but that had been hours before. And uh, this very gruff officer, Officer Murphy, uh, kind of came up and uh, started uh, quizzing me, uh, wanted my license and registration, made me uh, do all variety of um, uh, tests to gauge my sobriety and gave me a breathalyzer and uh, went back. And in the interim, these other police cars pulled up behind them, a paddy wagon and these other things. And uh, the officer Murphy came back to the car with this kind of grin on his face. He said, I, and I made the mistake of telling him I was just, I was a professor. I was trying to get back to my family, which really idiotic. You enter, made this element of class enter the conversation as well. <laughs> And uh, so the, when he came back to me, he's like, oh, I, I've got good news for you. You passed the, the breathalyzer. And I was like, oh, that's great. And he's like, I got bad news for you, professor. There's a warrant out for your arrest. And he, he uh, <laughs> pushes me up against the grates and takes my arms behind my back and pins me and down and puts me in handcuffs. And I'm, I'm, I don't know what is going on. And uh, he then brings me uh, back to the cruiser uh, and he tells his partner, and this is where I was kind of racially slurred, he says, it's always a good day when you can bag a sand in uh, and, uh, and the N-word. And then he puts me uh, into this cruiser uh, and I'm taken to, um, to first a, a precinct in Midtown Manhattan, where I, I find that uh, the warrant in question is for uh, a 5'8 white guy who, who weighs 160 pounds. I'm, you know, 6'2 and uh, not white. And you know, hopefully I can be below the 200 pound mark when I'm exercising, uh, but clearly not me. And the officer in question had seen that I saw that warrant and he said, you know, tough shit, you can tell it to the judge. Uh, and so I ended up um, spending, and I didn't get a phone call when I went into essentially a drunk tank. And you, you might not know this, I certainly didn't walking the streets of downtown Manhattan and the buildings of Wall Street and the skyscrapers that- I was so surprised. Feet is it one of the biggest uh, urban subterranean jails that exists is right below your feet central booking and uh that's that's where i was in this uh uh room with all of these other guys uh mainly men of color uh and they were talking and they you know everyone was kind of talking about what they were picked up for and i was really shocked and they started laughing and they said i remember uh this one dominican guy told me he's like if your skin's darker than a grocery bag and you're out on the streets at the end of the month, you're in trouble, brother. Uh, so that, and a lot of the stuff that I thought was just conspiracy theory, he talked about a competition between precincts for callers and uh, various aspects of stop and frisk. And a lot of these things ended up um, being actually true and found to be unconstitutional um, by uh, U.S. District Judge Shira Shindlin, uh, NYPD whistleblower actually corroborated a lot of the stories these guys were telling me. But that was my first uh, uh, little, uh, you know, and then at the end of this entire time, the public defender I had said, oh, clearly this isn't you. Uh, I was, had arrangements to, to, to leave. And the judge found out that I was a professor as well. And he wouldn't let me have the, be, have the case be dismissed. She said, uh, you can come back and talk to me when you've hired an attorney. Uh, oh. And so I actually had to go uh, back another time with a, an attorney friend to get this matter resolved, which was, uh, you know, uh, not even for me. Uh, and I was, of course, I was really pissed off. I was on my soapbox when this happened. I, you know, did, I was very public about it. I was on the radio. I wrote some op-eds and I even ended up suing the city of New York. Um, and winning a, a very modest, not a life-changing sum in any way, but a modest settlement against them, which I would come to find out was um, part of uh, nearly a uh, uh, billion dollars that the NYPD had paid out in police misconduct suits over the last decade and a half. So this was, you know, something that they did pretty frequently. Yeah, and that was that was your first in, um, introduction to sort of race and policing. Um, we're going to go into you. you, you it, the description of being in this holding cell is so uh, it's so vivid. The people that you bring to life um, here are just you know these immigrants who've been caught 
uh, just because they're they're selling things on the on the pavement and they don't have a license and then they can't pay for the license and and then you have like some guy who had been running a meth lab and he's telling a funny story because when they when they came to get him as he said he was banging his 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 girlfriend's mother on the kitchen table you know and, and so you, you've got this amazing <laughs> even in the middle of this I think my mind would have just been in this blank spin of like how do I get out of here and and you're just observing you know and collecting all of these stories which you do in subsequent jail terms and we'll get to that in a second um but i just wanted to ask you there is one point which, which you took one point you do talk about which is um and we will get to why you had subsequent jail terms um but what what is your relationship to other people's stories as a writer because you do discuss this in the book you discuss this kind of conversation that you have with yourself a questioning about this because you you kind of feel like you're still on your soapbox a little bit and then you pull yourself off yeah that's right and especially this early uh time i didn't know if i was appropriating these men's stories um they were really very colorful and vivid and i i think you're right i mean my instinct was to try to disappear into the wall so as not to be seen of course i was kind of uh, afraid for my own safety. I, I don't think I really necessarily needed to be, though I did see some acts of violence, but nothing directed towards me. Um, but I was just kind of um, watching everything happen. I saw the kind of prolonged uh, part of bureaucracy. Um, the cops can keep you legally um, for up to 72 hours without any kind of criminal charge, which apparently during stop and frisk, numerous innocent New Yorkers were treated in this way. And, you know, it made me think about also what happens to someone who is a priori um, being uh, constituted as criminal when they're not. If you are stopped when you're innocent, it's got to change your relationship with the um, police thing, make you more paranoid, um, all of these different things. Um, but uh, later on, and, and when we'll get to that, um, in that instance, the men that I was with uh, made me promise that I would tell their stories. And so in that instance, it was a little bit different because they had shared, I spent more time as we'll talk about with these men and I, they shared their hopes and dreams and intimate details about their families. And um, they said, you have a voice out there. No one cares about us. Um, and we want you to do something with that. And so that was an, a, a, I won't say a burden, but a, a responsibility that I felt when um, as a writer, um, this is the only way that I can make sense of this traumatic experience and also reclaim my own story and do what I promised these men, which was share some of their experiences, um, much of which had been sent in, spent in institutional settings of one kind or another. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and as you make a very clear point of, um, most of them are do have skin darker than a, a paper bag as 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 that person put it to you um the element of racial of of a race in the american correctional system is uh is it's so strong and it's something that strikes you and i think this book it, this book does so many things it's on the one hand it's a spiritual journey it's a it's a self uh it's it's a really powerful self-evaluation it's a story of a, a, a my it's a migrant story it's so many different things but it also is uh, an examination of race and policing in america um but there's a really interesting thing a point that you make yourself um and that is at one point you're teaching uh people um i think in queens i can't remember um and you're teaching these people who you say are some of the best students you've ever taught and they're part time. Uh, they're, there's a lot of women They're 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 not highly educated people, but you're teaching them uh, writing and they were wonderful. And at one point, one of them said something that really made you question your your sense that your skin and black skin or the black or the African American experience um, that that you had that you were kind of this part of it that you were part of the experience of uh being black in america and you you it was quite sh shocking and interesting to you can you talk a little bit about that and your understanding that came from it 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, and I think you're talking about, I, I taught this wonderful class at Queens College, which was uh, the LEAP program, the Labor and Education Advancement Program, where I think I had 12 mothers and grandmothers and a firefighter called Tyrone uh, in this class. And we, we read all kinds of texts and they told me um, very clearly that, uh, you know, I, 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 as a person of color, I was not the same as them, that I had immense privilege. And of course, what Tyrone was telling me was true. He said, you know, my ancestors were slaves on the plantation, right? Your ancestors chose to buy a plane ticket and come over here in order to, and um, Indian Americans actually are, um, per capita, have the highest income, even more than Caucasian Americans. Yeah. Um, so, and yet there is a way, I think this is maybe why my story is unique, because I'm kind of um, perched on the precipice between someone who has benefited from enormous privilege and someone who's also been discriminated against because of my skin color. And I, I, I recognize also that, you know, the time that I spent, and correction was about really these 90 days that we'll talk about, is a drop in the bucket compared to what many people uh, had to spend in the kind of um, generations worth of institutional um, racism uh, that uh, African Americans deal with on a, a, a daily basis. And so uh, I think Asian Americans, you know, have their own uh, kinds of obstacles to contend with. Uh, and I, I just think maybe um, why I like that term person of color is because um, I think it creates a kind of a bridge between people who are otherwise voiceless and creates a larger political consciousness that in, includes all of them, uh, all of us. Um, but you know, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I would find that lesson time and time again, even at Hartford Correctional that, no, you know, you really aren't one of us. In fact, you know, you might be Arab or you might be uh, some other nationality. And um, yes, I think I just got a little narrow window in what it's like to be uh, Black in America today, but I would by no means say that my experience overlaps uh, in any um, substantive way. Yeah, and you make the point that um, there are actually more Black people in um, the U.S. prison system or correctional system uh, than there were slaves. Um, so that's that's really quite extraordinary. Um, now let's get into how, how you ended up back in prison and this time pretty much on your own steam. Um, it came from, and, and, and I mean, normally, you know, we do know about a little bit of in Europe, soccer, hooliganism and all that sort of thing. But your love of soccer led you down a different path to crime. Tell us a little bit about that. And you, we leave, leave the really good juicy details for, the, for people to read in the book, because I, I do want to get to the uh, being in Hartford Correctional Center bit. But do give us a little bit of a taste of how you Yeah, got you know, I, I have in, in the book, there's a chapter called The Three Poisons, which um, is uh, in Buddhism, there's this idea that uh, uh, greed and uh, desire uh, and unhappiness are these kinds of the cock, the 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 pig, and uh, the snake, and they're in co Buddhist cosmology, eating one another's tail in a ceaseless pursuit. And so, what happened to me during this time? And it almost feels like stuff I was doing, making really bad decisions, and stuff was happening in the universe as well, because it's almost like there was this drishti, as we call it in Sanskrit. I was swept up in this black crowd, and I could really only. I mean, the thing that happened initially with these soccer tickets is I was trying to um, watch Lionel Messi, the great Argentinian player, play in the Meadowlands. And I had a pre-sale code and I was going to get tickets from me and some of my friends. And I ended up um, somehow ordering $20,000 worth of soccer tickets. Uh, my, my credit card had been so charged multiple times for the same amount. Uh, and I had no idea until I opened my mailbox and it was overflowing with all of these tickets, uh, Ticketmaster subsequently refused to take them back saying I had ordered them. The credit card referred me to Ticketmaster. They said the only thing that you could really do is claim them as fraud. And then I had this very brilliant idea. I think I was really in this magical realist uh, way of thinking that my way to solve this problem would be to resell these tickets. I, I could even maybe I would turn a profit, who knows? And so I tried to sell these tickets and of course, I wasn't able to turn a profit. In fact, I lost an extraordinary amount. Somehow, with my stomach in knots, went to the soccer game with my friends. Uh, You're to right. Still out of a game. What's that? Didn't know that she didn't know. Money. No, I hadn't told her any of this. And um, when this all happened, uh, and I was pissed off. I mean, I felt uh, both the credit card company and Ticketmaster had made a mistake, and they were kind of making me pay. I decided that I would, in fact, 
claim them as fraud. Um, what I didn't realize is that I had made these ticket purchases at Central, at the University of Connecticut where I was teaching, and I had to, in order to go forward with the claim, file a police report with the Central Police. And so I went in and I, I told them essentially what I'm telling you, except I left out this very important detail that I tried to resell the tickets because, you know, <laughs> I, oh, I, that would be, I was claiming ownership of, of them. I will just say, you know, they were erroneously um, uh, ch charged to my card, which was really uh, idiotic. And that was really kind of what happened. I didn't really quite understand either the ramifications or the seriousness of what I thought. I was on the parking and transportation committee with these guys. And I certainly didn't think that they were serious police officers in any way. I kind of felt like this was some kind of formality and it was my way of getting back at um, these companies for um, screwing me over. And so you landed in, in Hartford Correctional Center. Uh, uh, that's what it's called, isn't it? The, HCC, yeah. Yes. Um, and now here you come into, um, I'm just, you, you really have uh, a lot of time. <laughs> As they say, there's nothing else to do. So one of the people says to you something like, um, you sleep your time, you're golden. You know, you sleep off your sentence, you're golden. There's, there's no rehabilitation, there's no programs, there's nothing. Everybody, they do play a lot of chess, which I found very interesting. Um, you have, you play chess with gangsters who, absolutely wipe the floor with you. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> but you you do learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about people. And um, I just want to invite you to, we'll, we'll, we'll go into some of what, what you learn about yourself, but let's talk, let's talk a little bit more. Let's go back to the people you're with. One of the people, there's so many people, there's so many stories in here that are so moving, but one of the most extraordinary ones is Jay. Mm. Um, is the story of Jay. And maybe you want to do a little reading. Um, sure, yeah. So this comes from about two thirds of the way through. Uh, and as Linda mentioned, I mean, the long and short of all of this was that I had to do the, a 90 day pretrial detention to satisfy the state. And every time I hear that uh, phrase, it makes me think of a, a goddess that needs to be propitiated with human sacrifice somehow. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, during these 90 days, I spent time, it was very different than what I expected. I wasn't in a cell, I was in a dorm with 60 other men. Um, and one of these guys is Jay, who uh, I meet when I initially go in, and then I meet him again. And this is our second meeting. The next day, wandering the cubes again, looking for a card game or a story, I stumble into Jay again. He's an entertaining rock on tour, and I quiz him on the reasons he's been at HCC so frequently. Why? Drugs, bro. But can't you get a program? I've been there, done that. They got no beds anyway. All I do is kick it, kick the drugs in here. The withdrawal's unbearable. Medical don't do squat for me. I got a tight fist squeezing my chest tighter all the time. Jay appears to have grown wiser and more melancholy than I remember him. That was beautiful. Did you ever think of writing any of this down? Shit, I've been writing since the day I was born. Really? Show me what you're working on. The next day, Jay hands me a page torn from a journal. Early evening, stepping off the city bus express to the airport where I often sleep in a sitting position. A bed is a luxury for a junkie babbler. Ooh, baby, when I met you that terribly cold winter, I just wanted to suck on you until I got through your hard candy shell right down to the sweet sap running wild down your thighs. But I'm a creep show carnival ride, damaged goods. Stagnant pond scum praying to God I can puncture through scar tissue to hit that hidden vein. I lay awake at night and you split the universe in two. All is not lost. I hunger for more than I've ever known. I'm sick of standing in the human centipede of a medicine, medicine line. Let's do this together. Hand in hand, through bridges and shadows, your ice cream thighs, your lollipop eyes. But I'm alone, afraid of the night when sleep comes to everyone else while I lay awake. An apparition centuries old, like the Colosseum's construction site dust, making tomorrow storm clouds. You're that lovely haunting lullaby that finally puts me to sleep, and that golden morning glow every time I wake. Jay, this, this is good. I mean it. This has real potential. I'm serious. It's, it's better than much of the work being produced by my students. You can have it. You sure? Got me hundreds of pages in notebooks, all filled front to back with writing and drawing. It keeps me alive. That very night, 
Jay's moved to another dorm. Like many of these men, I will never see him again, though I will sometimes pray he's found his way to get clean. If he does, it will be in spite of, not because of, the system. I wish I'd gotten the chance to see what else he had in his notebook, and it makes me feel dejected to imagine all those words in tone forever. The week drags by in part because of an inmate who has been up all night coughing and in the morning is moved to quarantine. The rumor quickly spreads throughout the dorm that he has TB. When I ask the CO in charge, he looks uneasy before confirming it. None of us, including him, have been tested, and he doesn't even know if the disease in question is communicable. It is. For the next few days, we're in lockdown, which means we are allowed no movement, no phone calls, no television, no visits. Our meals are brought directly to our bunks, and we can only get up to use the bathroom. Uncertainty, boredom, obliviousness, cruelty, these seem to be the tropes of the correctional handbook. When this time passes, I spend as much of it as I can with Carl. He tells me he has a brother who played in the NBA and now owns car dealerships all up and down the East Coast. He shows me the long gash he has running from his breast to his sternum, the result of a knife fight in the 1970s from which he lost so much blood, the doctors didn't think he was gonna make it. He tells me about the five pillars of Islam, beginning with Shahada, the most important, the simple affirmation of singularity, that there is no God except Allah, and that Muhammad is his last one and only messenger. Hajj, the pilgrimage to Kaaba in Mecca, is the last pillar he has left, and he hopes, if he ever gets out of jail, to complete it. I write down his information and promise I'll write him a letter when I'm on the outside. When July 3rd finally arrives, I'm antsy, agitated. I've been told I will be allowed to walk right out of jail, but I don't know for sure, and the not knowing is killing me. A handful of us are meant to be released on this day, and I shuffle forward with them to reclaim my street clothes. I've been given my certification of discharge from all Connecticut confinement. It lists my inmate name and number, my docket number, and my offense, as well as instructions about how to restore my voting rights. I've been advised to keep this on my person for at least a week, just in case I'm picked up and thought mistakenly to have escaped. When the prisoners to be released finally queue up, we each stand on our own without handcuffs or ankle shackles lost behind our own eyes. We are marched out in unison to the Sally Port, where the prison vans, those infamous ice cream trucks, will be securely unloaded with new prisoners coming in later tonight. Then the reinforced doors creak open. There, in front of the alleyway, greeting us like a mother's open arms. We're free. The sun is bright and we're hollering, whooping, skipping as we walk. One of the inmates with me, with the same EOS as me, has just finished serving a 12 year sentence for attempted burglary. And the last time, uh, the last time he was out, uh, he has been telling us how foreign he imagines the world will be for him. The last time he was out in the world, there were no smartphones, no hybrid cars. His baby girl was only three years old. Now she's a teenager with a baby girl of her own. He turns in slow circles with his arms outstretched around and around and around with his eyes shut tight. Women and children wait for some of these men. Their hugs and high fives. One man lights up a cigar. I walk slowly, reflectively, breathing deeply, drinking in the colors and reveling in each step. Not knowing when I might be released, no one is waiting for me. I'll have to borrow someone's phone to get a ride. Just like every other time I've entered and been released at court, I walk around the perimeter of the facility where I spent some of each season last year, seeing it from the outside for the very first time. Gates within gates, razor wire, the cracked asphalt edge of the yard where I played basketball and had my finger broken. I walk back around to the front doors of HTC where my visitors would have come in to see me. There are the tinted windows behind which the CO presumably sits and there attached to the wall is a list of articles of clothing forbidden to be worn by visitors. These include halter tops, sports bras, spaghetti straps. There's a securest machine where someone can put money on an inmate's phone account. Connecticut's former governor Jody Rell and a number of elected officials are investors in both this company and in Key Foods, the company that runs a virtual monopoly in prison commissary items throughout the state. That's too depressing to linger here any longer. I walk out past the car dealerships in the post office, the skyline of Hartford, once the insurance capital 
and more recently, the murder capital of America rising before me. I go into a Dunkin' Donuts and borrow a phone to call Julie, without whom it feels like I wouldn't still be alive. In spite of mounting cataclysm, we could still sense each other's mood across a room and make each other laugh, which are blessings beyond compare. I can't wait to intertwine my finger in hers. Thankfully, I still have people in my life willing to give me a ride who believe in my inherent goodness. A writer friend of mine thinks that bad experiences don't make us any better. They just make us worse. Waiting for a ride back to the small town in Connecticut where I have been living. I can't say for certain whether or not I agree with it. That's absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful taste of the book. Um, I'm seeing that our time is running out. I've got so many questions for you. Um, and I did want to talk a little bit about Connecticut, but let's, we'll have to leave that one um, um, for um, after questions. Um, but I do have one final question before we turn over to uh, audience questions. And that is, just talk us through just briefly, why correctional? Why this, why, what is the meaning of this title? Yeah, so, you know, of course, as poets, we love policy me and um, words that have multiple connotations. So correctional, literally, I mean, I spent 90 days at Hartford Correctional. A lot of the story takes place there. Um, but it also, uh, in a sense, is uh, my own correctional, my own attempt to make amends with the people I might have harmed, my own reclaiming of my story, because the other thing we didn't mention is when this was all happening, I was going up for a full professor uh, going up for promotion to full professor at the State University. And so my case became enormous local media. I was um, on the news and the Hartford media, and much of the coverage was sensationalized and even erroneous at times. And so a correctional to all of those narratives and a reclaiming of the story. But I think the larger thing, and my hope, and those of you that read the book, I hope it is not just an inert literary artifact, but um, it feels my experience has made me realize what I knew conceptually, but experiencing it firsthand and viscerally makes me so certain that our um, criminal justice system in America is broken, that it's in need of a serious correctional. Uh, and um, I hope that this book in some ways m m motivates people to, to get involved and to be active in any small or large way uh, to, to help this real, one of the 20th, first century's biggest social problems that exist in America, I think, today. Yeah, that's, uh, and it really is, it's a cry for justice. And, um, and also, I thought, too, it was about your own sense of, you, could you constantly talk about yourself and the problems that you find in your own attitudes, whether it's kind of Brahmin superiority or, you know, this sort of sense of, of anyway, it is, it is a spiritual journey. It's a self-evaluation, a self-correction as well, um, and a cry for justice. Um, and we do have some questions. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to stop talking myself and uh, turn over. There's one question from MB Holman. And uh, they ask, uh, how has the pandemic affected your family, your life perspective and your writing? And how do you think it's affecting the world of the written word in general? Mm. Well, a large question, I think for one, um, I wouldn't be probably having this wonderful conversation with Linda who's in <laughs> Australia and I'm here in Providence, Rhode Island, were it not for the pandemic. But um, look, I think that it is, uh, in, in some ways um, has made it really clear um, who uh, the line between the haves and the have nots and the people who have to work during the past. I'm a, a teacher, I could teach my students on Zoom, but the frontline workers and first responders and those people working at grocery stores and doing the cleaning and jobs that no one wanted to do, they didn't really have that choice. And so I think it, it has exposed a lot of the fault lines that exist in America. Um, I have found it to be pretty productive as a writer, just a solitude. I mean, I'm really itching to get back out there. I, I also love traveling and um, being around people and being social. I mean, I wish we could all be in the same room together. That would be so lovely. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I think we need to, at the end of the pandemic, work really hard to, I mean, I, I find a lot of my students are a little afraid. They're, uh, they're fearful of kind of going out and reconnecting with people. And, and maybe that will also be true for writers. I, I think the one thing though the pandemic has done is it has brought, um, made it so, made us realize that we're really globally interconnected and we're all being affected by this. And we all have much more in common than we 
have uh, not in common with each other. Yeah, um, I, I would just add that for the writing world, um, not so much the writer working on their stuff, for which you know lockdown can be quite a blessing. I mean, I finished my shortest history of China <laughs> in the first <laughs> lockdown in Australia. It was quite good, but um, yeah, absolutely, it has shown differences of class. Uh, you know, people of more precarious income have, been, have suffered a lot more and had to do a lot more. But also, um, I think a lot of people with books that have come out during the pandemic have not been mm. able to present them as much. Um, yeah. I mean, this is really good. Thank you, Zoom. But um, it's not, you know, it's not like doing a book tour. So, um, you know, that that probably is another way that it's affected people. It's it's it really hurts. Um, that ability to get your work out there. Another question from Greg Cantor, um, who says, thank you both for this fascinating conversation. Ravi, I'm wondering whether you took inspiration from other historical writers in incarceration and whether your experience in prison aligned with, their, with that literary history or if your reality defied those stories. What a great question. Mm, absolutely. And it's actually when I, um, I ended up eventually, though, um, I, I got to keep my promotion. Um, you know, the, thankfully, I had a union and I was tenured, but it had become a toxic place. And I got this fellowship to study at the University of Sydney, where I kind of first uh, spent time with Linda. And um, during that time, I actually did a PhD looking at um, prison memoirs written by American men of color. And um, while I was simultaneously working on this, and so I was quite aware of the other, there's this great book by um, Austin Reed, which is, I think, the oldest prison memoir and also one of the newest published. It was just pretty recently discovered by an antiquarian bookseller and authentic, authenticated by some scholars at Yale. I think it's called The Life and Adventures of a Haunted Convict, and it was written in the 1850s. Uh, and uh, it's a fascinating book. And in fact, he, uh, in this book, has these passages of um, magic realism and invention and you know, I, I think what I realized um, is that there, uh, th uh, there's this theorist, Elaine Scarry, who says that suffering and trauma don't simply resist language, but actually destroy it, bringing about an immediate reversion to a state anterior to language. Uh, and that I, I feel that traumatic experience sometimes is, is distorted in, in some way. And um, um, I, I feel like my story is unique because I, I didn't find any other Asian Americans around me. Uh, I think I was probably also one of the only um, professors that were out. I had very di vastly different kind of socioeconomic background than many of my the men. And I was probably in there for a briefer period of time. I mean, there is um, a wonderful book by Alf Albert Woodfox called Solitude, Solitary rather, where he describes his life in Angola prison. But of course, he was there for years and years and was intimately familiar. This book is really, I had a kind of a brief brush, um, but these 90 days were enough to kind of fundamentally transform my life and make me realize how interconnected all of us are and how that beneath our very eyes, because it's a really modern phenomenon, that in 1980, there was about 250,000 in prison, people in prison. And last year, there was over 2.1 million. So almost eight, nine hundred percent increase in the last 40 years. And are we any safer? No, actually, crime rates have stayed the same. And then you overlay that with who is being incarcerated. And that statistic that Linda mentioned comes from that great book by Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, where she talks about that. If you were born in 2001 as an African-American male, you have a one in three chance of being arrested. Right, which is mind boggling in the country that's supposed to be the bastion of freedom and the place where life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are available to everybody. Um, that this has been kind of allowed to happen underneath our very eyes um, has been shocking to me. And I think my experience has um, made it so that I can't go on with my life as normal, even though I've this is a long time ago. I still, uh, it has kind of changed me irre irre irrevocably, I think. Mm, yeah, um, we have another question from Greg. <laughs> um, so he says, Ravi, can you tell us more about your parents' journey to the US? And I will say, read the book because there's a lot about that. Um, and has the recent trend towards vilifying immigrants given you a new appreciation and interest in their experience? Mm. Oh, I, I am already so interested in their experience. It just so happens my dad is very taciturn. He won't really talk about it, but I can't. <laughs> 
he came as, you know, there of course um, were these uh, um, anti-Asian exclusion acts that existed, these immigration quotas. And if you came from countries that were deemed undesirable previous to the 1960s, you really couldn't enter the US. And my father was part of that very first wave. Oh yes, there they are. Oh, you're so good, Linda. Yeah, they were my parents on their wedding day. You know, and they uh, had an arranged marriage. My father was part of that first wave of Asian immigrants. He came in the late 1960s to go to school at Howard. Yeah, there's me. You know, they always have me rocking the bow tie or the little suit. Yeah. <laughs> yes, with my sister Rajani, who uh, teaches down in Florida. Um, and, you know, what, what, I always used to think that he went to Harvard, no, but he went to Howard in DC, which is a primarily African American school. And, I, and he was there, living there when uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and they sent in the National Guard. And, um, you know, so that disjuncture between what he must have imagined uh, America to be and then ending up in DC in the middle of the civil rights movement and then bringing his wife, who was someone who he, he met once before, the second time they met was on their wedding day and she was much younger than him. You know, and I also think that was how courageous of her to leave everyone behind to live, move halfway across the world to live with this man who is now her husband. Um, yeah, I, I, I really do uh, have a lot of empathy. And I think that the, the only thing I'll say about there's recently been this kind of anti-Asian sentiment with COVID and other things, but it's nothing new in American history. You know, uh, the Japanese were interned during World War II. And uh, the US has a long history of treatment of uh, marginalized groups in, in terrible ways from the indigenous people to African Americans, to Asian Americans. So while it's been really disturbing to see this kind of rear its head, it's something that I think is embedded and maybe, and I wish we had more time to talk about this, Linda. I would be so curious to hear your perspective coming from Connecticut to Australia, but Australia, begins every public ceremony with a, a kind of a, a, a welcome to country and acknowledgement of the original stewards of the land, which I know my Australian friends think is lip service, but that I was always really profoundly I'm into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this is like, I'm, it's in the air and it, I can never, I mean, imagining it happening in the US is like so mind boggling. And I think that's why we haven't healed this original scar that exists. We still we still haven't healed it, but I, I, I want to say that growing up in, in New London, Connecticut, um, as the do my grandparents uh, were immigrants, um, and you know I grew up at a time where Jewish when Jews and Blacks were excluded excluded from the New London Country Club, the Yacht Club, the you know all of this stuff. My father, who had a little business, couldn't belong to the Businessmen's Association because again Jews and Blacks. So, you know, this is, it's, <laughs> but yeah, Australia does have this really good thing. I mean, I grew up in New London on Montauk Avenue next to Pequot Avenue, you know, and we would go to the Mohegan Hotel, but it was just names. It wasn't anything when I was growing up. And I only learned later that some of my classmates have indigenous heritage, but I didn't know it then because nobody, it wasn't you know, claimed or yeah, they didn't probably teach you about the mystic massacre and the burning no. of the many Pequots, right? The, yeah, never, never, no, yeah. no. So, no, this is terrible. We're already at 10 o'clock and we have so much to talk about. I mean, I've got pages of <laughs> questions. We're going to have to do a redux of, of this conversation, I think. <laughs> I know. I want to thank, thanks so much to Pierce and to the Brookline Booksmith. Um, it's been absolutely fabulous. And thank you, everybody who has... Uh, who has tuned in, um, conquering their Zoom fatigue <laughs> uh, to come and be with us today. It's been really lovely. And thank you, Ravi. So good to see you again. I want to see you again in Australia as soon as possible. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, Pierce. This has been oh, such a wonderful you. conversation. Yeah, thank you both so much. I, I know, Linda, you have so many questions and I could listen to each and every one of those <laughs> questions. I could keep going. Um, this has been utterly fascinating, very important. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. We got lots of questions both in this event and in my inbox about the video. So yes, it's being recorded and we'll get it on our YouTube channel shortly. Thank you everyone for joining us. We have copies of Linda's latest book and correctional Robbie's book in the store.
support your indie bookstores, everyone, and yes. stay safe. Definitely. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.